If the Ordnance Survey Memoirs offers a, a view from outside, um, the, the voice from within, um, I think, is best encapsulated in James Seaton Reid's History of the Presbyterians of Ireland, which is published in 1834. This great narrative presented Presbyterianism as an integral part of the civil history of Ulster. It celebrated the connection with Scotland and reminded the world that this was a community with their own story to tell. James Seton Reid's history is one of the key texts in Presbyterian writing and, and quite possibly is probably one of the key texts in Unionist writing. It, it imagines a sense that, and as some people have said, that the Presbyterians are kind of a proto-state within the state. And the creation of a historical narrative, a chronology of events, and an analysis of those events gives a sense that Presbyterianism has arrived. An Ulster Scots identity has been developing from the 17th century through. And during the 19th century, it is reinforced, of course, with the economic connections between uh, Belfast and, and the Clyde. It's also reinforced by the fact that many people, uh, particularly in the east of Ulster, see their identity as an amalgam of Irishness and Scottishness. Um, it just comes naturally to them. Nowhere was that mixing and mingling of identities more clearly seen than in Ulster's commercial capital, the old Presbyterian town of Belfast, an Irish town that had Scotland in its DNA. The cultural identity of the people of, of Belfast at that time was Irish, British, Scottish, because again, there were all these frames of reference. A lot of the doctors would have done their training in, uh, in, in Glasgow and Edinburgh rather than in Dublin. Uh, many of the Presbyterian ministers would have done their training in Glasgow, Edinburgh or St Andrews rather than Dublin. So you had that, if you like, that Scottish influence. Many of the most influential professors at Belfast's academical institution were also graduates of the Scottish universities. Opened in 1814, this was an attempt by Belfast citizens to establish a new university in Ulster. In the, the period after the Act of Union, in 1800, you do get a sense of a community trying to make sense of itself um, again. And significantly, one of the ways in which they try to do that is through education. This is a, a hugely ambitious institution. It's an, um, it's an institution which seeks to, to provide a means of educating the young men of Ulster. Architecturally, it's a very imposing presence in the town. It's a striking building. And it speaks of the, the kind of cultural ambitions of, of the middle classes of Belfast, that they wanted an institution like this that they could call their own. Many of its students would become the natural leaders of their society. But among the first to study here were seven young men fired by the spirit of the age, driven by a real thirst for scientific knowledge in 1821, they founded Belfast Natural History and Philosophical Society. And just 10 years later, they built this museum, further proof of Belfast's growing confidence and civic pride. Belfast was all about resourcefulness, tenacity and ambition. That's what built this museum and filled it with exhibits. In this building, citizens came face to face with a live crocodile, marveled at explosive demonstrations of galvanic electricity and attended lectures galore, all in an effort to satisfy their growing thirst for knowledge. From the 1820s on, there were over a hundred different scientific societies drawn from all social classes. Science was becoming an integral part of Belfast's commercial success and civic identity. But for many Northern Protestants, it was an intense connection with religion that helped make sense of a changing world.
As the development of a deep water port opened Belfast to the world, Danes, Germans, Lithuanians and Russians, along with people from every corner of the British Isles, flocked to this thriving town. From the 1840s on, a new metropolis rose out of the mud, but industrial success also attracted significant migration from rural Ulster. That growth means drawing in from the outlying rural areas, vast swathes of population, Catholic as well as Protestant. So a whole spectrum of rural political identities in terms of Irish Protestantism, orange and loyalist identities, are being imported into the city. It's a city uh, whose Catholic population is growing uh, in the 19th century, so that Catholic and national identity is also uh, becoming critically important. No one single identity could define this place in the mid-19th century. But when Queen Victoria visited in 1849, she formed the distinct impression that Belfast was an Irish town. She recorded in her diary that wherever she went, she was greeted with the Gaelic motto, Cade Mila Fulcher, 100,000 welcomes. It even appeared draped across the offices of the staunchly unionist newsletter. There was a very, very strong presence of the Irish language in the civic society here. The people in Belfast were quite open to the Irish language, which was something that they saw as belonging to both Ireland and to, to Britain. But this Victorian boom town was a very different place to anywhere else on this island. Remembering the poet Samuel Thompson's description of identity, Belfast may have seemed Irish all without, but it was still very much Scots within. The cultural orientation of Ulster is towards Scotland and the northeast of England, particularly with Belfast, that it's recognised really quickly as a place where, you know, young men with purpose can make their livelihood and make their business succeed. They're not recognised as, as, as different, they're recognised as being a part of a cultural whole, so they come in and they're driven by a need to succeed. In this age of industry, centuries-old links to Scotland were renewed and reimagined. The sea between Belfast and Glasgow became an industrial zone, bringing coal and steel, along with Scottish workers, Scottish capital, and most importantly of all, the Scottish entrepreneurs who would play a vital role in Belfast's continuing success. This six-story colossus combined Scottish granite with Scrabo stone. It was completed in 1888, the year in which this town became a city. Its architect, Robert Young, who had studied in Scotland, wanted to create buildings that would rival Glasgow and Edinburgh, an architecture that spoke of Belfast's distinctiveness and pride. This building, another fine example of Young's work, holds so many clues to the different facets of Northern identity at the dawn of the 20th century. Emblems of the three kingdoms speak of a proud history. Images of industry and empire celebrate a confident British identity and Belfast's acknowledgement of her place in an imperial world. 